when you compartmentalize your Islam, Islam is just about having a good heart, or Islam is just about salah, or Islam is so long as you know you speak the truth and you're, you know, you have good manners, right? Every time we throw one out, we say, but this is what's important. Isn't this exactly what happened to the Ummah? He said, Tunqad Ural Islam Urwat al Urwa. The knots of Islam, the strongholds of Islam will be undone one after another. Every time one is loosened, people cling on to the next one. <coughs> the very first of them to be undone will be rulership, ruling by the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the very last of them to be undone is what? Salah. And the Hayat Sahih Muslim says, La tuqamu sa'a hatta la yuqalu fil ardi Allah Allah. The day of judgment will not start. Until there, it is no longer said in the earth, Allah, Allah. Allah is not mentioned on the earth any longer. And of course, salah is the ultimate mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That's the, the most obvious fact of Islam, reality of Islam that Muhammad sallallahu came with. Most recognizable. Once that's gone, that means nothing is left from prophethood. Which means there's no good left in this world. So Allah will destroy this universe and bring about the hereafter. So salah is the first and the last of Islam and of this Ummah in reality. We'll end there inshaAllah Azza wa Jal. We'll open the floor and some hands when I about questions and we'll defer the rest of the subjects to the following weeks. Tell the pain. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Lahu alhamdul hasan. Wa al-thanamu al-jameel. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah al-malik al-haq al-mubin. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah al-mab'uuth rahmatan lil-alameen. Wa anna asdaq al-hadithi kitab Allah ta'ala. خير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. We begin in the name of Allah, the Most Merciful, the Bestower of Mercy. All praise and glory belongs to Allah, Lord of the Worlds. Indeed, Allah is deserving of the best of thanks and the most beautiful of praises. And we testify that none is worthy of worship but Allah alone, the True Supreme King. Alone without any partners, and that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, that he was indeed his prophet and his servant and his messenger, whom Allah sent as a mercy to the world. Just as we testified the truest of words are the words of Allah, the great glorious Quran, and the best of guidance, the Sunnah, the example of the messenger of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the most dangerous of matters, the newly added matters into the religion, for every single one of them is a leading astray that only leads to the fire. To begin, we welcome everybody back to this, which inshallah will be our second session on the Biya Sahabi uh, initiative, right? So this series that we had began, and I know I had uh, skipped last month's visit and I apologize for that. We began a series of talks that we entitled Biya Sahabi, Biya Companion, meaning the, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we began that first lecture by saying that the Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, the companions of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were the model generation that Allah out of His mercy provided this Ummah with. There was never a generation more virtuous than them, nor was there ever a generation that understood Islam better than them, nor anyone, any generation that ever enjoyed Islam the way they enjoyed Islam. So they are the gateway to Islam and they are the security policy for Islam. This talk, inshallah, tonight will be a continuation of that, just to bring to light the necessity of that security policy. Why it's so important to track down the footprints of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet wasallam, and to scoop our Islam from where they scooped from, and to understand our Islam the way they understood it. And to have the same method and approach towards understanding Islam as they did. We all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with His perfect wisdom for a very lofty objective and a very extensive wisdom in and of itself and that is to test us. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا He is the one who created death and life to test you which of you are best in deeds. So this life, from its beginning to its end, all of it is but a test. There is no exception. On every level and on different magnitudes, but it's still a test. 
before one test ends, the next test has already begun. That's the nature of this life. Even in times of ease, when you're not being tested, that's a test. Are you going to be grateful? Right? But when we think tests, many a times we think that Allah tests us with poverty or with riches, with disease or with health. Right? There is another entire category of tests and those are the tests regarding the information that He sends down to you. The facts that He revealed to you. How are you going to deal with them? Understood? Because a person can say, Allah sent the revelation down and I've been guided, alhamdulillah, I've been guided to Islam, I'm a Muslim. But the Muslim is the one who says 17 times a day, guide me to the straight path. Why? Because especially in light of what we're talking about here, this information being guided to the revelation of Islam and conforming to the revelation of Islam happens on two levels. Guidance is on two degrees. There's guidance to Islam, guidance to the path, to the straight path. And then there is guidance within the path, within your Islam. A person wants to get to a certain destination. There's a certain path that he needs to take. Identifying that path and getting onto it is not the end of the road, is it? If you want to get to New York, you need to know that you take, among other routes perhaps, the 78. You take the 78 heading east and you know you found the path, that's it. And you've gotten onto the path. Can that get you to New York? without you being guided within the path to make sure you're following the speed limits and look out for the slopes and the turns? Or can you just close your eyes once you're on the path? So guidance happens on two levels. There is guidance to the path, to Islam, which is the straight path. Then there is guidance within Islam, within that straight path. Al-Imam Ahmad al-Nasai, they narrate that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an reported that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he drew a line one day in the ground, a path and then he drew diverging lines, departing from it and then he turned to the companions and he said to them هَذَا طَرِيقُ اللَّهِ this is the path of Allah وَهَذِهِ سُبُلٌ متفرقه. And these are paths that are diverging, descending, departing in opposite directions. عَلَى كُلِّ سَبِيلٍ شَيْطَانٌ يَدْعُو إِلَيْهِ On every one of these paths going the wrong way is a devil, a shaytan inviting to it. And then he recited the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-An'am. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And this here is my straight path, so follow it. And do not follow the other paths that would divert you from my path, from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you notice even in this ayah, just to bring to mind once again the point of the lecture, the necessity of digging out the path of the companions regarding their Islam. And this is my path, follow it, don't follow the other paths. So the path of guidance was mentioned in the singular. Whereas the many multiple paths of misguidance were mentioned in the plural. And this is always the case. The path of truth is one. And the paths of falsehood are plenty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah in the Quran, Allahu waliyu ladheena amanu. Allah is the guardian and the guide and the protector, the ally, the supporter of the people of faith, the believers. Yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumati ila nur He removes them from the darknesses, different, many, multiple, to the light. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاؤُهُمُ الطَّاغُوتِ يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظُّلُمَاتِ And the disbelievers, their allies are the false gods that pull them out from the light to many different darknesses. 
And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elsewhere in a third place in the Quran was speaking about the light of guidance and the darkness of misguidance, he said, There are layers of darkness once on top of another. So pitch black that if a person wants to pull his hand out, the most familiar thing to him, sometimes he can't recognize it, right? He can't even see his own hand. Imagine a night without the moon, without any street lights. Darkness is one level over another. If a person were to pull out his hand, he wouldn't be able to see it. And whomever Allah does not grant a light to, there will be no light to And Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawood and Imajah and others, they narrate from Abu Hurairah that the Prophet وسلم, said, the Jews have divided into 71 groups. All of them in the fire except one. And the Christians have divided into 72 groups, all of them in the fire but one. Right? Those that upon the original teachings. And my ummah, my nation as well, will divide into 73 groups. All of them in the fire except one. So 72 out of 73 are those diverging paths. And this hadith is authenticated by Ibn al-Arabi and Ahmad Shakir, Ibn Taymiyyah, and Al-Bani and others. Rahimahumullahu jami'an. So this is our discussion. We're studying the path of the, the Sahaba as a security policy to make sure we're part of that one out of the 73. To make sure we're part of that saved sect, if you will. So we can save ourselves and our families and educate the world around us. And this subject I know comes automatically with many sensitivities. You know, some throughout the history of Islam, they, they found this hadith to be problematic. Because they said, how can that be when the, the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ is the majority of the people of paradise, right? This makes it seem like no one's going to make it. First of all, by way of transmission, the hadith is authentic. And this argument that was posed against the hadith or seemed problematic with the hadith doesn't stand. It's not in reality a problem. Why? Because first of all, the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, will indeed be the majority of the people of paradise. Because he was the only Prophet, first of all, whose nation was not just in his time and his locale. He was the one that Allah distinguished him by sending him to all of humanity. That's first of all. Second of all, a person should not presume that these 72 groups, the number of people in each group are the same as the number in the 73rd group. You understand? They're not all equal not by the bounty of Allah, the pure understanding of Islam. That is what matches with the fitrah. That is what people are born upon. And that is the vast majority of this ummah is upon. The way of the sunnah, the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also, it's understood from the many texts in the Quran and in the Sunnah that just because the hadith says a person is in the fire means they are qualified by virtue of that crime, that virtue of that sin, that vir by virtue of that deviance of being in the fire, it doesn't mean for sure they will be in the fire. And it does not mean they will, they will spend forever in the fire if they enter the fire. You understand? So when for example the Prophet wasallam says, no one will enter paradise so long as there's an atom's weight of arrogance in his heart. Meaning he does not qualify for paradise like that. Understood? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive that. Or he may have other good deeds that make up for this bad. At the end of the day it scales, isn't it? And so the default rule, by the way, all throughout, is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises something, he will always do what he promises. But when he threatens with something, then it's up to him. That's not dishonesty, right? It's up to him whether he carries it out or he includes it in his benevolence and his mercy. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also of the things we need to say about this hadith being seen as, you know, one that should be avoided <laughs> and one that, you know, is overly sensitive and, you know, steps on toes. The Prophet وسلم, said this would happen. So it's a reality. So when it's there, a person shouldn't just ignore it, right? 
We're not dividing the Muslims by talking about this. Nor is that our intent, nor should that ever be understood. We love for everyone guidance. And it pains us to hear that a non-Muslim, what about a Muslim? Even a non-Muslim would enter the fire. We would not love that for anyone. That's part of the personality of the believer that he inherits from his Prophet But ultimately there's going to be people that go down that road. So we're just going to ignore that that road is there. You know, there's a beautiful quote I read years ago, it stuck with me. They said, what is worse, a baby that's afraid of the dark or an adult that's afraid of the light? You know? A person has all the symptoms there to believe something's a reality. He doesn't want to believe it. He doesn't want to go check out, check it out. He has all the symptoms of diabetes, but he doesn't want to go to the doctor because he doesn't want to hear, you have diabetes. All right? So this is an issue of a, rea of a reality. And also, something that has to be mentioned about the sensitivity of the subject is that these sects that divided, they divided on matters of the deen that were not excusable. Like who Allah is, like what, what the definition of faith is, right? What the Qur'an is. These are not referring to, for example, the Hanafi and Shafi and Maliki and Hanbali, schools of Islamic law that differed on how to interpret a certain text or otherwise, right? We're not talking about the differences on the, the technicalities of the prayer or whether saying you're divorced three times in one sit-down equals a divorce or whether wiping on the socks is allowed or not in wudu. We're not talking about that at all, right? These are all tolerable, acceptable differences of opinion that do not harm in any way. We're talking about something that comes way before that, a matter of principle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again, He had a wisdom for allowing these divisions to occur. To test us how we're going to react to them. Allah says they're going to never cease being divided, humanity, until the day of judgment. And were it not for a decision from your Lord that had preceded, He would have ended the disputes. But He wished for these disputes to exist to test us how we're going to react to them. So let's, let's get to the dispute now. So there's 73 doors. All of them lead to the fire, except for one. And we're, there's no way to figure out which way that one is, right? Absolutely wrong. There's definitely a way to figure it out. But it, it is indeed requiring of you to live up to the test and dedicate seriousness to it. Because consider a few factors, six factors that will make this test most difficult and most worthy of your determined investigation. The first of them is that the probability of you being right by guessing is one out of 73, right? That's a problem. Already, the odds are against you percentage-wise. Number two, each of these 72, 73 have each of these doors has someone standing there, an advocate for it, that calls to it and says, paradise is this way, and you pick any other door, you're going to the fire. They all say the same thing. Everyone swears they're right. Everyone swears they're following the Quran and the Sunnah. All right? All those 73, say Quran and Sunnah, because he said, my ummah will divide into 73. Meaning whoever rejects the Quran and the Sunnah is not part of his ummah to begin with. They don't accept his religion to begin with. Right? As the poet, he says, Right, Layla is this woman that Qais was in love with, right? In famous uh, Arabic folklore. Not folklore, it was reality. First Hijri century. Qais ibn Amr. So, the, he says, and everyone claims to know Layla. Everyone claims that he know, they know this girl. <laughs> it's a metaphor, huh? We use throughout the centuries. And Layla does not approve of any of that. Like a celebrity, everyone swears that, you know, this celebrity, she knows me. And if you ask her, she doesn't know any of them, right? Like what everyone swears, listen, I got the keys to paradise, right? And if you... In reality, this is not the case. That's the second problem. The third problem is that you can't judge a book by its cover. It's not that easy, right? Seeing these people, these advocates who the Prophet ﷺ called devils calling to each of these paths, in and of itself is convincing before they even open their lips. The Prophet ﷺ foretold that a people will come out from this ummah known as the Khawarij, 
who came out and their effects remain until this very day. Khawarij the rebels, those that call the Muslims disbelievers by, because of a sin they commit. They call a Muslim, an apostate, a disbeliever because he commits a sin. And they call for rebellion against the Muslim ruler to the end of it. He said to the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar, the greatest of the companions, one of you will belittle his prayer to their prayer. And his fasting to their fasting. His recitation, how much he recites Quran compared to how much they recite Quran. And he said, these are the dogs of the people of the fire. Can you imagine? Because they have no, no regard for the sanctity of human blood. No regard for the virtuosity of the companions. No regard for the students of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No regard for the Muslims themselves. Ibn Abbas, when these people came out and they called Uthman ibn Affan, the third caliph, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth caliph, these two companions, disbelievers, Ibn Abbas, one of the greatest students of the Prophet وسلم, went out to their camp in Harura. He said, when I entered their camp, there was about 20,000 of them. He went to debate them, debate them in the theology. He said, you hear in their tents at night like the buzzing of bees. I mean, they're reciting, reciting, reciting. They're devout worshippers at face value. He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet said about them, يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ لَا يُجَاوِزُ حَنَاجِرَهُ But they recite the Qur'an, it does not pass their throats, no understanding. And even years later, the, the Caliph al-Mansur, he used to say about a man, one of the, the earliest leading philosophers, who established a sect, or was part of establishing a sect known as the Mu'tazila. His name was Amr ibn Ubayd. The great caliph was mesmerized by him and he brought him close. And he used to say, Kullukum yamshi ruwayd, kullukum talibu sayyid, ghayru amr ibn ubayd. He used to uh, flatter him and compliment him with poetry. He would say, all of you walk around the earth strolling. All of you are looking for a, a bird to, to hunt. Meaning you guys are just taking your time. No one's serious about their religion like this guy. Right? He looks impressive. All of you stroll about in the earth, is what the poetry means. All of you are just gazing around for your hunt, for your game to pray, target practice on, except for Amr ibn Ubayd. This Amr ibn Ubayd had a mark on his forehead that looked like the knee of a goat from how much he would prostrate, how rough his skin was from here. And this is one of the heads of deviants in his time. So that's factor number three, that seeing them could be convincing, like the Khawarij and, and otherwise. And then number four is that when they do open their lips, when they finally do start speaking, they're eloquent and they could have an argument, especially when you don't know any better. That makes it even more difficult now. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna akhwafu ma akhafu alaykum ala immatul mudillun. The greatest thing I fear for you are the misguiding leaders that will be appointed over you. Those that cannot be trusted, but you assume that they can be trusted. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in another narration, أَخْوَفُ مَا أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ مُنَافِقٌ عَلِيمُ lisan." The greatest thing I fear for you is a hypocrite who is eloquent with his tongue. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, another hadith, إِنَّ مِنَ الْبَيَانِ لَسِحْرَ Indeed, in the ability to articulate is the power of magic, right? Can someone get you to pull your money out of your pocket? Right? A good salesman, can he do it? Indeed, in the ability to articulate is the power of sorcery. The fine art of persuading your desires, known as advertisement, <laughs> right? So when they do speak, they're very, very, very eloquent. You know, one of the, one of the scholars, he mentions that they brought forth one of also these Muslim philosophers and they asked him to give a sermon in front of a great audience of royals. And he had a lisp, you know when you have a lisp, you can't pronounce all the letters of the alphabet. He couldn't pronounce the letter Ra. And if he, that would have been heard about him, that discredits you. You're not someone that deserves to be, you know, the cleric of the Sultan, right? Even though in reality there's no clergy in Islam. But the point is, you wouldn't be held in a high repute automatically, you'd be dismissed. He gave a sermon, some of the historians recorded in writing, approximately 15 minutes long, off the top of his head, without using the letter Ra. Can you imagine? <laughs> and this guy sitting in front of you talking to you, you're going to be convinced. And then number five, is that their sources when they speak are the Quran and the Sunnah. Right? 
In the hadith of Hudayf and Bukhari and Muslim, when the Prophet ﷺ spoke about the end times and the confusion that will occur at the end times, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then there will arise du'atun ala abwabi jahannam, callers at the gates of the hellfire. Man ajabahum ilayha qadafuhu fiha, whomever responds to them, heeds their call, they will throw cast him into the fire. So Hudayf is a Messenger of Allah, describe them to us so we can take guard. Who are these people? What are they like? Qala hum min jildatina wa yatakallamuna bi alsinatina. They are from our skins. They dress like, just like us. They look just like us. And they speak with our tongues. They use the same evidences we use. The same arguments we use. Yet they're callers at the gates of the fire. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. One of them, Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, mentions in al fisla He'll come to you and he'll tell you, for example, forget how consequential this debate is or not, but just think about it. What if I told you right now, I could prove to you from the Qur'an and the Sunnah that this cockroach is a prophet? That the cockroaches have prophets? This was, a, this was an actual sect, historically speaking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is no nation on this earth, nor is there even a flock of birds that fly about with their wings, illa umamun amthalukum, except that there are nations just like you. And elsewhere in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن مِّنْ أُمَّةٍ إِلَّا خَلَى فِيهَا نَذِيرٍ And there is no nation except that a warner was sent to it. So are there warners now for the birds and the cockroaches and the beetles? According to those two ayat, yes or no? Yes. And that brings number six, that we don't know any better. Right? We haven't studied, we haven't given this subject any seriousness yet. So now that I've drawn the atmosphere of how difficult it is, it's impossible. No, it's not impossible. Do you think that our Prophet ﷺ is going to teach us about every single thing, big and small, and leave the most important subject, how to get safely to Allah, unidentified? Right? Be a Sahab. That's the answer, isn't it? You know Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu says, that the Prophet ﷺ died when he died and there was not a bird left in the sky except that he informed us something about it. He told us how to understand the whole world around us. You know? You know even the non-Muslims recognize this about the Sahaba. In Sahih Muslim, the collection, the Jews came to Salman al-Farisi, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ, and they said, إِنَّ نَبِيَّكُمْ لَقَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَ Say, so your Prophet, what's up with your religion? Your Prophet teaches you everything, even how to use the bathroom. So Salman radiallahu ta'ala an, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, yes. He taught us not to face the Qibla, the direction of prayer, or to turn our back to it when we're urinating or defecating. And to not cleanse ourselves out of the bath, in the bathroom with our right hands. And to not cleanse ourselves with dried meaning uh, droppings of animals and to not use less than three stones and he gave him the rules so our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to teach us to that degree and he's the one that told us أنا لكم, أنا لكم I am to you like a father to teach you so he's not going to teach us how to get out of this one out of 73 uh, dilemma he said to us and my ummah I left out the end of the hadith on purpose and my nation will divide into 73 sects. All of them in the fire, except for one. They said, which one, O Messenger of Allah? He said, what I am upon today, underline the word today, right? What I am upon today, me and my companions. Right? What am I upon today, me and my companions. And in the hadith of Arbal ibn Sariya that we mentioned in the previous session, the Prophet wasallam said, whoever of you lives after me will see many differences. It's exactly what we see. Isn't it? We'll see many differences. So this hadith is the prescription for what we're living. Whoever lives will see many differences. So what do we do? Ignore the differences. Act like they're not there. Throw out our religion for the sake of unity. What do we do? He said, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي So stick to my way. وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتُ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ 
stick to my way and the way, the tradition of my rightly guided caliphs, the, the Sahaba, the companions, and beware of all the new, and he said, bite onto it with your teeth, and beware of the newly invented matters, meaning in the religion, for every single newly invented matter, innovation is in the fire. You know, we all agree, all Muslims agree, that if the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was alive today, he would be able to solve all of our problems, right or wrong? Right. Him returning to us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in effect is not very far-fetched because he left everything here and Allah preserved it all and even embodied it in a generation that showed us practically how it worked, right, these companions. This is such a blessing. And he'll turn away from the way of the companions. It is truly, truly, truly a betrayal of that legacy and what Allah had done for us. You know, and yeah, this is an example we always give, and it's really worth considering. I'm not talking about the Quran being preserved, or even the words of the Prophet who brought the Quran being preserved. The words of the Sahaba were preserved authentically. We know exactly what this companion said, what he didn't say in many, many, many instances, beyond counting. Meaning our narrations of the companions are more authentic than the actual book, the holy book of the other religions. Think about that. We're not comparing the Bible to the Quran in terms of preservation throughout history. Not even the Bible to the Sunnah. The, not even the Bible to the way of the companions because the way of the companions is more authentically documented than even the, the Bible itself. And this is something agreed upon even by their scholars, by their scholarship. So a person to turn away from that enormous blessing, you know, every religion claims that we are the right group and we are orthodox and we are the classical version, but there's no way to verify it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved for us a mechanism so when we're studying this subject now of Bia Sahabi, we're studying the method, the methodology for our lives. Like what's your method? How do you go about understanding your religion? The religion has been preserved, now the understanding. Even the understanding was preserved. Because think about it, if Allah didn't preserve for us the understanding of Islam, then He didn't preserve for us Islam, did He? If Islam could mean 101 different things, then what's the beauty of it? What's the difference between Islam and the philosophy of Plato, right? They all agree that beauty is right and justice is right and truth is right and brotherhood and fraternity is right and common welfare. We all agree on all that. All of us. So what's so special about Islam? That down to the details, it's been defined for us and lived by a generation and has proven itself past the test of time, the test of criticism, the test of corruption, all of it. So turn a blind eye to all that. Is someone jeopardizing themselves? The Prophet ﷺ didn't leave us to pick those 73 doors or go through what the other nations went through. And so before we embark on picking a way to understand our Islam, we have to check if that was the way of our Prophet ﷺ and the companions. So that we don't waste our lives, by the way. We don't waste our lives embarking on a path that could be the wrong path. We took an exit or a detour that wasn't the right way off of that path. You know, some of the early Muslims were asked, what is the scariest verse in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And they said, قُلْ هَلْ نَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ عَمَالًا أَلَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا Tell them, O Muhammad, shall I not inform you of the greatest losers, the greatest failures, the greatest wastes with regards to their deeds? Those that their deeds, their efforts were in vain, their striving, they were actually striving in vain in the life of this world while presuming that they were doing good in deeds, presuming that their deeds were in excellence. And that's why Abu Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, rahimahullah, he says, إِنَّ مِنْ سَعَادَةِ الْحَدَثِ وَالْأَعْجَمِي أَنْ يُوَفِّقَهُمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لِعَالِمِ مَهْلِ السُنَّةِ Indeed, it is from Allah wishing well for a person when they are young or when they first come into Islam to direct them to a person of knowledge from the people of the Sunnah, the original way of Islam, for the shortcuts, right? So he doesn't try all the doors and waste his life. These are the signs that Allah loves somebody. 
He gives them the proper understanding of the deen. And before Ayyub, the Prophet ﷺ himself said that, in the Muawiyah in Sahih al-Bukhari, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينُ Whoever Allah wishes well for them, He gives them the proper perspective, the proper understanding of the deen. And also Ibn Shawdab, rahimahullah, he says, إِنَّ مِن نِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ عَلَى الشَّابِ إِذَا نَسَكَ أَنْ يُؤَاخِ صَاحِبَ سُنَّةٍ يَحْمِلُهُ عَلَيْهَا Indeed, it's from the favor of Allah upon the young person once he comes up, becomes of age that he finds next to him someone to a, a companion from the people of the Sunnah, people of the way of the Prophet Sallallahu to carry him, to put him upon that. And Yusuf ibn Asbat, rahimahullah, one of the greatest scholars of the early Muslims, of the Tabi'een, of Tabi'een, Tabi'een, he says, كَانَ أَبِي قَدَرِيًّا وَأَخْوَالِ رَوَافِضْ فَأَنْقَذَنِ اللَّهُ بِسُفْيَانِ He says, my father was a Qadari. Qadari are the people that, uh, the opposite of a hard determinist in philosophy. The people that don't believe in fate at all. Nothing is fated. This is one of the groups, right? That God doesn't know it till it happens. It's one of the groups that went, you know, infatuated with a certain philosophy and they wanted to subordinate Islam to that philosophy. Yes, yeah, so my father was a Qadar. He believed in that concept regarding destiny. And my, uh, my paternal uncles were Rawafil. They were Shiites. The Rawafil are the 12 Shiites, those that uh, reject. Long story, right? The Shiites, right? The more extreme group of the Shiites, in particular the Rawafil. He says, so, and Allah saved me with Sufyan. He sent me Sufyan al Thawri, rahimahullah. And he, Allah guided me through him. He sent that scholar my way. I discovered him early, early enough in my life. And I'm going to close in five minutes, inshallah. Open the floor for questions. We know that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was the most merciful person when it came to somebody struggling with applying the religion. Don't we? So for example, the man said, O Messenger of Allah, the Abu Imam, and I said by Ahmed, give me permission to commit adultery. Like permit me, I can't control myself. Permit me to commit adultery. He took him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would you like it for your mother, would you like it for your daughter, would you like it for your aunt, would you like it for your aunt, maternal, maternal. No, likewise, the people wouldn't like it for their mother, nor for their daughter, nor for their aunts. And then he, sallallahu alayhi wa put his hand on his chest and, oh Allah, forgive his sin and cure his chest and protect his private parts. And the narrator says, the man never turned to women again, right? Meaning he wasn't bothered anymore, he was able to control himself thereafter, walking the streets in the marketplaces and the likes. We know, for example, the hadith of Anas in Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ sees a man, a Bedouin. He doesn't know the, the ethics of town life, city life. He comes into the masjid. He's used to it from the desert. He's a Bedouin. You pick a corner, there are no corners. You just urinate anyone. He came into the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ and he urinated facing a pole. Just uncovered himself, lifted his garments and he urinated. And the Sahaba, the companions, were about to attack him. Right? Imagine someone walks into the masjid and just pulls out a cigarette. Thing. Takes out, starts unbuckling his belt and he's just picking a corner, right? Until today, even we know the hadith and we're still like, no way, man. <laughs> it's hard to control it. The Sahaba were going to jump on him. Prophet said, let us remove, don't cut off his, let him finish. This was from his wisdom and his gentleness. He knew the man didn't know. And also because if you chase a man down who's urinating, because he's dirtying the masjid, he's going to dirty more of the masjid, isn't he? Right? He's going to be urinating and running. More staining, isn't it? For from his wisdom, sallallahu and from his mercy, right? That he didn't hold against him what he did not know. And also the man who kept drinking wine time and time again, time and time again, and the punishment was carried out on him, until finally a companion said, how wicked is he? May Allah curse him. How many times are you going to get brought back, get arrested for the same crime? The Prophet, sallallahu said, don't curse him. For he, indeed, he loves Allah and his Messenger. Meaning these are struggles that people have. Demons we all face are different demons till the day we meet Allah. Sins we're trying to get past day in and day out. He was merciful with all of that sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And we know that this is his norm. But when it came to the issues of how you understand your deen, he was much stricter. And that was part of his mercy, by the way. I just want to show you the contrast. Right? Whoever is not interested in my sunnah is not of me, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa This is the one who pulled in the, the arrogant and the enemy and the adulterer and the drunkard, all of that. He, his heart accommodated all of that. But he tell him, whoever is not interested, whoever turns away arrogantly and pridefully time and time, who doesn't, who doesn't want it, he's not of me. 
all of them in the fire except one. When it comes to this issue, he was much stricter. You know why? Because unless you have a proper understanding of Islam, this is where the mercy comes in, you will not be able to handle Islam. You're destroying yourself by building for yourself an, your own system that you're fond of and thinking that's going to save you or that's going to be accepted of you. So there had to be some seriousness there out of mercy for them, right? It called for it. I'll give you a quick example. Those who disagreed on the meaning of faith, some of those affected by the theology of the Christians said you're saved by your faith, meaning you're saved by grace. And this is a very wide misunderstanding that exists in the world, that your faith is in the heart and it doesn't matter what your actions do. I'm not going to ask you about the Muslims, but those that the Muslims got this understanding from, what was the result of that misunderstanding regarding faith? Faith is in here, it doesn't matter what you do. That they do everything, don't they? So long as they come on the Sunday and they cry and they feel good about themselves, they keep it moving, don't they? So this misunderstanding is a disaster in and of itself. When people have a misunderstanding on destiny, whether Allah destines everything or things are divorced of Allah, Allah is in control of everything. Isn't that what causes people to fall into despair? Isn't that what causes people to become lazy and think, I can't do it, right? Not productive human beings. The understanding is the pad from which your Islam launches. So without that proper understanding, Islam is not going to be handleable for you, right? It's not going to be possible for you to handle it. And from the mercy of Allah, and with this I end, is that this initiative to be a Sahabi, to revive for yourself or for anyone and those that you love so we can all worship Allah correctly and be able to receive, right, and handle His perfect balanced religion, the perfect Islam, the original Islam, the only Islam, Allah has allowed in every generation there to be people that carry this understanding even though others may disagree with them and others may uh, falsely accuse them and others may build campaigns against them, they always exist. In Sahih Muslim, men else with the Hayt al-Mutawatir, narrated by Jabir and so many others, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي على الحق ظاهرين لا يضرهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم كذلك. They will never stop being a group of my ummah, of my nation, apparent upon the truth, not being harmed by those that, dis those that oppose them or those that betray them until the affair of Allah is fulfilled. So they will always be there. But notice also, the hadith says there it will never stop, meaning it started all the way from the beginning. That's the extension of the way of the Sahaba. May Allah be pleased with them. So we'll, we'll end here, and that was the gist of why we're studying now the way of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why it's such a necessity. We spoke about their virtue and why they understand better, and why Allah is pleased with them and what we know about them. And now our need to rush back to that. That was today's session. From then on out, inshallah, we'll discuss bits, landmarks, milestones of how the Sahaba understood the matters of belief, how the Sahaba understood the matters of, his, of law, how do you approach the rules in Islam, the, the issues of ethics, right? The issues of purification, spirituality, purifying the heart, all of that one session at a time, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah permits for us the length of life to do so. Jazakallah khayran, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.